So then welcome all to the organic synthesis class uh, within the Atlantis program. This will be a class which has four hours a week. Uh, we have a two hour tutorial in addition which will not be on tape but the four hour lecture will be. We are expecting to have 22 modules. Each of them should have approximately 90 minutes on uh, methods in organic synthesis. You can download the syllabus from the net to see what every two hour lecture will be uh, in. And uh, with this, uh, we will start today. And we will start today with a concept I have begun to appreciate when I was in the group of Professor David Evans at Harvard University as a postdoc. And he was very much inclined to tell us about stereoelectronic effects as opposed to steric effects, a concept of course you all know that many reactions are driven by sterics. The bigger, a group, the bigger the groups are, they try to avoid each other. But electronic effects are just as important. And I would like in these two hours to introduce this concept to you because it's a very strong concept to explain many, many uh, issues you encounter when you do synthesis, but also when you do spectroscopy, when you analyze structures, and uh, many other things. So today's lecture will be on stereoelectronic effects. And let me start to introduce this with something you very well know already. And this is the concept of drawing mesomeric structures. And as a typical example, let's choose a very simple molecule here, an L cation, and of course you all know that we can draw two mesomeric structures by shifting the pi electrons here, and thereby we derive at two different structures, and the concept here is of course the more of such structures you can draw, the more stable is overall the compound. Now, instead of drawing mesomeric structures, you can also analyze that by orbital theory. And let's do this also for a moment. If you look at this isolated, and we, if we say that we have a hybrid here of a pi bond and a p orbital, then what we are combining here is that we have a pi carbon-carbon bond. And as we will go in a little bit more detail in a moment to each binding orbital, there must be, by definition, an anti-binding orbital as well. So we have a pi star carbon-carbon bond here, orbital. And then on the other hand, we have an empty atom orbital, a p orbital. Now if we now combine these two halves to new atomic orbitals, from the atomic orbitals to the molecular orbitals, what you're getting is three new orbitals here, from which one is filled, these are the two electrons coming from here, and two are still empty. Now, I'm sure you have seen this, we can draw these orbitals, <coughs> the normal pi system where we have one orbital which has no nodes here. We have a second orbital <coughs> which has one node here. And then we have a third orbital which has two nodes here, and this is the typical 
uh, analysis you probably have seen in earlier lectures when you analyze Homo Lumo theory in cycle additions, something again we will do in this lecture in more detail as well at a later point. And you can construct such, such an L system consisting now of three molecular orbitals and the stabilization overall you can see that one of the atomic orbitals is occupied now and it is lower in energy than the starting orbital here from the pi cc bond and this is the mesomeric stabilization which simply results by mixing two of these orbitals uh, and that is the analogous picture to what we had here uh, by looking at resonance. Now a slightly different example but to look at this and, but still very similar and I'm sure also very familiar to you Let's look at dimethylformamide. Again, we can draw two resonance structures. And again, we could analyze this by such an analysis where we would involve all these three atoms, the pi CO bond and the lone pair of the nitrogen and construct a similar, uh, construct similar orbitals as we have seen here. But an mo even more simple way is to look again at the pi CC sorry, in the pi CO bond in this moment. And the empty pi star CO orbital. On the other hand, we would have the lone pair from the nitrogen. And now if you think about which orbital interaction only makes sense, it is certainly not an orbital interaction between the lone pair nitrogen and the pi CO bond because both of these orbitals are occupied. And one of the rules you have here is that mixing orbital gaining stabilization by delocalization of electrons can only occur if you combine a filled orbital with an empty orbital or at least a partially filled orbital with a partially filled empty orbital. So in this case we can leave the if we mix these, we can leave the pi CO bond alone, but what we can mix are the states of the lone pair nitrogen and the pi star orbital. And again, by mixing them in the resonance theory by delocalization of the orbitals between the lone pair nitrogen and the pi star orbital, we get two new states. One is lower in energy than the two original states here. One is higher in energy, but of course only this state, because we have to fill in two orbitals, is occupied. And this picture now basically gives you exactly the same picture you can draw from these resonance structures. Because look at this. What does these two resonance structures tell us? It tells us that we are shifting the lone pair nitrogen towards the carbon and at the same time we are breaking the carbon-oxygen double bond. So we are breaking or we are weakening the carbon-oxygen double bond by gaining strength here in the NC bond. The breaking of the carbon-oxygen pi bond is reflected in that we occupy, we start occupying uh, electron density into the pi star CO orbital 
basically we delocalizing electron density from the lone pair into this pi star orbital. And this is exactly what we see here. By occupying the pi star orbital, we weaken this bond. And in the extreme mesomeric resonance structure we have here, and resonance structures are always the extremes, uh, we see that this bond is completely broken. So I think that's the concept you know very well. And let's define, again, the rules for drawing resonance structures. And the rule is move electrons but no atoms. So basically exactly what we are doing here, we shift electrons, we delocalize electrons and if we do this and uh, do not make mistakes here that we suddenly draw five binding nitrogens or other things, we get legitimate resonance structures and this way we can see that a molecule might be more stable than other molecules who do not have these type of resonance structures. Now the first thing to realize here is if you look at this definition, usually what we do is we move pi electrons And we, you, we move lone pairs, mostly of heteroatoms. But nobody really said that it has to be only pi uh, or electrons or that only lone pairs can be moved. Nobody said it cannot be also sigma electrons. And this is now the part we would like uh, to, I would like to tell you today about that this sigma bond delocalization, sigma electron delocalization is what we mostly will talk about or discuss in terms of stereoelectronic effects today. And that it's basically the very same thing. It's resonance or it's orbital interaction, but rather than these more common pi electrons and uh, lone pairs, we will also involve sigma electrons. And again, you know this from very early on. If you look if you look at a carbocation, you have always learned that a carbocation is stabilized by additional alkyl groups and that alkyl groups are donors. It's not really clear why that should be if you just look at this from the uh, idea of electronegativity. Between, because a carbon atom, of course, is, has the same electronegativity as the carbon atom it's attached to. And therefore, it's not really clear on that kind of argument why a methyl group should be a donor or not. But the concept of hyperconjugation is uh, that you can actually use the sigma bonds here to stabilize this positive charge. And so what I could do here in the very same way as I would uh, do it with pi electrons, I could draw a resonance structure here involving this sigma bond here and then I would become a new resonance structure here. And we all know that this looks kind of funny because we have a free floating atom here. But in the definition that I have only moved the electrons and, and let the atoms at the same place, that is still a legitimate resonance structure. 
it might not contribute very strongly uh, to, the, to the overall structure, but nevertheless, it is a possible resonance structure and it simply very nicely shows you that uh, this sigma bond can also act as a donor, as we will see as a much weaker donor than compared, for example, to a lone pair, but nevertheless, such a stabilization is there. And if you look at this again from the terms of orbitals, what have we done here? We have a we have a sigma CH bond. This sigma CH bond is existing, so it's occupied. We have the p orbital from the carbocation here, which is empty. And by mixing these two states, we are getting two new states where one is now lower than the starting sigma CH bond and also lower of the pi or p orbital here. And again, this results in an overall stabilization. And we can also draw in the electrons to sh show this donation. So here we would have the sigma CH orbital which could donut, donate electron density into the empty p orbital. And by showing this picture, the second rule should become immediately clear here that you can only draw such resonance structures, of course, if you have, as we said already, a filled and an empty orbital, but also equally important is that orbitals must be properly aligned. They must have they must have the right geometry to each other in order that they can interact. And this right geometry is usually found if these orbitals are parallel to each other, or you will also see that they can be anti-parallel to each other. And so just let's take an example where this is not the case. If you would have, for example, this carbocation in this novel name structure, where we would have the p orbital aligned like this. And as you can see, although these hydrogens are adjacent, they cannot line up with this p orbital and therefore a stabilization is not possible. So let's look at combination of orbitals. The typical scenario you have that you might have a carbon orbital which might be hybridized second one 
here. And if these orbitals align along the axis, you will form a bond. <coughs> And since they overlap on the binary axis, this is a sigma bond. So this would be the sigma CC bond. And as we said already, if you do these type of combinations for each binding orbital, you have to form, uh, for each binding orbital, there's an anti-binding orbital. Or in other words, the rule is that if you combine two atom orbitals, you have to get out two molecular orbitals. You cannot destroy orbitals. The number of orbitals always has to be constant. And of course, the other combination you could see here is that orbitals of opposite phases interact here. And this would lead So the typical representation of an anti-binding sigma CC orbital here, where there's no electron density between the two carbons. Of course, it's an anti-binding orbital, and where the bigger orbital lobes are on the outside of that, uh, on the outside of uh, the, the bond axis. And we will see such orbitals quite a number of times uh, when we look into stabilization effects. And very similar you can construct pi bonds by overlapping, for example, p orbitals orthogonal to the binding axis. And again, this results in a binding orbital. And if the opposite lobes overlap, This would result in an anti-binding orbital. And I should draw this in a little bit different way. <coughs> By pushing these electron lobes out, because if opposite orbital lobes interact, this is a, this is a non-favored interaction. And so a typical representation of a pi star CC orbital would like this. And now if you have typical situations, let's look at an oxygen-oxygen bond here in hydrogen peroxide. Again, we will look at this in a little bit more detail later. What kind of orbital interactions could you, for example, Discuss here.
In this case here, we have a lone pair of an oxygen. Is there any orbital available it could interact with from this oxygen-hydrogen bond here? And indeed, there is, if you look at the anti-binding orbital here, then you can see that this lone pair, if it would adopt uh, the geometry I've drawn in here, would be ideally suited to overlap here with an anti-binding orbital. And so typical types of stabilizations we will be looking on very often will be orbital interactions of lone pairs with sigma star orbitals. And so here, this would be uh, an interaction of the lone pair of this oxygen with the sigma star orbital of the OH bond. And as you can see here, is that this lone pair and this OH bond are oriented in anti-position to each other. And this is typically uh, the better uh, that, that's typically the, the, the best and the most favored interaction if interacting entities like this lone pair and the sigma bond here are oriented anti to each other rather than finding them in the syn orientation. OK, so far we have heard that <coughs> that orbitals can interact with each other if one is empty, one is filled. The other rule we have heard is that the orientation must be correct. The orbitals must be aligned properly. And the third rule. we have here is that the interactions of orbitals is the better the closer they are in energy. And again, this is something you probably have heard when you learned about cycloadditions, that homolumo interactions are better the closer the orbitals come in energy. And this is, of course, also true if you, if you talk about these resonance effects or stereoelectronic effects. Now, what you need to know, of course, now is, so when are orbitals closer in energy and when they are not? So what is the uh, energy? of different orbitals. And there are some very simple rules for this.
So the first rule is so far, or not so far, but in, uh, uh, always we have three different types of orbitals. We have binding orbitals. We have non-binding orbitals. non-bonding orbitals, and we have anti-bonding orbitals. And the bonding orbitals are always lower in energy than non-bonding ones, and the anti-bonding orbitals are always highest in energy. So that's already very simple. Then if we uh, look at the types of orbitals we have. Then we have sigma and pi bonds. That's what organic chemists need. Of course, the inorganic chemists will tell you there are many other bonds, delta bonds, and metal complexes. But for the analysis we do here, all we really need are sigma and pi bonds. And the sigma orbitals are always lower in energy than the pi orbitals. The typical non-bonding orbitals are lone pairs, lone pairs of heteroatoms, or can be also in a carbanion, a lone pair. And then we have anti-bonding orbitals. And here it's the reverse, the pi star orbitals are lower in energy in the sigma star orbitals, and we all know a pi bond is easier to break than a sigma bond, meaning that you can easier occupy a pi star orbital uh, with electron density than a sigma star orbital. Now, if we take this again a step further, we can analyze now the different states of sigma bonds depending on the atoms they are composed of. And the rule here is that the more electron withdrawing atoms are which compose the orbitals, the lower they are in energy. And again, intuitively, I believe that is very easy to understand because the more electron withdrawing the atoms are, the, the more likely they would like to take electrons in and therefore the more stable is the situation. And so therefore, if we have orbitals which have heteroatoms in there, let's say a, C, a sigma CO bond, this is lower in energy than a sigma CN bond, and this is lower in energy than a sigma CC, or roughly the same, a sigma CH bond. And this electron, this, uh, this drawing argument is true for all the bonds for all the uh, different types of bonds. So that's also true for the pi bonds. So a pi CO would be lower in energy than a pi CN and would be lower than a pi CC. And again, same is true for the lone pairs. Oxygen, let's say nitrogen here. And it's also true in the very same way. It's, it does not reverse here. It's also true for the pi star bonds. And finally, last but not least, it's also true for the sigma star bonds. And again, intuitively, this is clear. An anti-binding orbital will easier accept electrons if it has electron withdrawing elements, because that's what it means, electron withdrawing elements, or electron negative elements want to take, or are more likely to accept electrons than uh, uh, less electron negative uh, atoms here. OK, and so with this, kind of scale we have here, you can always decide if you're looking at certain orbital interactions, which ones should be better and which ones should not be as good. And so for example, it becomes immediately clear that in the beginning, the example we had 
of the allyl cation where we would mix an empty orbital or non-bonding orbital with a pi bond, that this is a relatively strong interaction because they are closer in energy, while the hyperconjugation we looked at, where we would mix an empty non-bonding orbital with a sigma orbital, that this should be not such a good orbital interaction, and therefore the stabilization you can, bond, you can gain by mixing a lone pair with a sigma state should be lower than mixing a lone pair with a pi state. And that is, of course, what we also know that the hyperconjugative effects are much weaker than normal pi resonance. So let's look how we can take this into some more practical examples. And so let's do some conformational analysis of molecules. And I would like to start with a, with a classic example probably here. It's maybe not the, the most easiest example. We will just in a moment see some even easier examples. But the classic example, I would start to introduce this is the anomeric effect, which is found in carbohydrates. And this is the phenomenon that In carbohydrates on the anomeric center, <coughs> when you draw the two possible chair conformers, did not do this very well here. That when you draw the two possible chair conformers, that for steric reasons, the equatorial positions are favored because you would like to avoid the unfavorable one, three diaxial interactions here. But nevertheless, you find by about 0.6 kcal per mole, that the axial conformer is actually more stable than the equatorial conformer. If you look at the same situation in the corresponding carbocycle, the opposite is true, again, by about 0.6 kcal per mole. The equatorial conformer is more stable than the axial conformer. And there has been a big debate how to explain that. And one argument, and it's a good argument, is that it was argued if you draw in the lone pairs of these, uh, of, the, of the oxygens here, where we have one equatorial one, Draw this a little bit better. And an axial one here. That what you create is that you create lone pairs in the equatorial conformer, which are oriented in the same direction, meaning that you have a larger dipole moment than you would have if you just look at the lone pairs in the axial conformation. And since all molecules want to minimize the dipole moment, a 
it was argued that from a dipole arg uh, argument, the axial conformer should be more stable than the equatorial because simply the dipole moment in the axial conformer is smaller than the dipole moment in the equatorial uh, conformer. And sometimes in the literature, you find this as the rabbit ear argumentation, because as you can see here, this in this type of conformer, the orbitals, the lone pair, are oriented a little bit like the ears of a rabbit. And so it was said that this is a rabbit ear, or the rabbit ear argument here. Now, there is another way to look at this. And again, we can look into orbital interactions here. And so let's do this also. So if you draw again, ah, the two conformers here. And look at possible orbital interactions. Then we can recognize here that in this conformer, we have a lone pair of this oxygen, which is aligned with the lone pair of the sigma star orbital of this CO bond here. And there's no equivalent interaction uh, in this conformer here where we can, where we could, for example, have here the CO sigma star orbital, and we could align it. In this case here, with the sigma CO orbital. So here we would have sigma O donating into sigma star CO. And if you keep this energy scale here in mind, you know immediately that this should be the better interaction because a lone pair is closer in energy to the sigma star orbital than the sigma orbital is in energy to the sigma star CO orbital. And so, therefore, this is the much better interaction here. Therefore, it was argued that for the stereoelectronic, for this orbital interaction, again, this is a more favorable situation. And so then it was argued for the longest time, what is the better argument? Is it the dipole argument, is it the stereoelectronic arguments? And in this case, I would say both arguments come to the same conclusion, and both are, uh, are good here. We know that molecules want to minimize the dipole moments, but as you will see here, there's also lots of evidence that such orbital interactions indeed are taking place, and therefore this concept is also a very valid one. And you will see in a moment that there are many examples which you can only explain with such a concept, but which you cannot explain by interaction, uh, by dipole interactions.
And so let's, let's look at a different example here. where we now look again at a six-membered molecule but having three nitrogens in here. And on these three nitrogens, we have T-butyl substituents. And of course, for steric reasons, immediately everybody would argue and say, well, of course, this should be the most stable conformer because now these huge T-butyl groups are oriented in the more favorable equatorial position. However, it was found that this conformer is not the most stable one. And in fact, by a pretty big energy difference, the conformer which has oriented one of these T-butyl groups in the axial position is actually more favorable. Why only one? Well, the steric argument for sure, if you would orient two into the uh, T-butyl groups into axial positions, would become very severe. But it was recognized that the T-butyl interaction with a relatively small lone pair apparently is not very, is not sterically very disfavored, and so therefore uh, this type of conformer, this conformer is for steric reasons not as disfavorable as it might seem in the first moment. But on the other hand, something must also stabilize it because otherwise it would still reside in the equatorial conformation. And so again, if we now look at the different orbitals here, in this conformer now, we are placing one of the lone pairs in an equatorial position, and this equatorial lone pair now is lining up perfectly with the sigma star CN bond. So the interaction we have here is that the lone pair nitrogen can donate electron density into the, into the sigma star CN bonds. And again, if you look here at the, at the same type of interaction you could draw here is you could again argue that there would be an orbital interaction between the sigma star CN bond, but in this conformer, it could only be with the sigma CN bond. So again, we would have interaction of sigma CN into sigma star Cn. And again, this would be a sigma to sigma star interaction. These orbitals are much further away in energy than the lone pair interacting with the sigma star orbital. And therefore, this orbital interaction is better. Now again, let's see if the argument, the dipole argument would also hold here. And again, immediately, you see, yes, it does because of this conformer, all the nitrogen lone pairs, let's draw in the third one here as well, are pointing into the same direction. So also from the orbital, uh, from the dipole argument here, you would also conclude that uh, this conformer should be severely less favorable than a conformer where I at least get one lone pair out of the way and pointing into 
a different direction. Okay, so this is still not the best example then. So let's look at another let's look at another one. Let's look at some bond lengths. Let's look at the x-ray analysis. Of this molecule here, where we have in this heterocycle, one chlorine atom oriented equatorial, and we have oriented one uh, chlorine atom axial. And as you know, ring flipping here from one chair to the other would not change that situation. These two chlorine atoms are oriented cis to each other. So in any type of chair conformer, one chlorine has to be axial, one chlorine would be equatorial. So if you analyze bond lengths here, you would see that in the X-ray structure, one bond is significantly longer than the other one. And this is the axial one. And again, the question is, why is this? And if we now look again for orbital interactions, we have a lone pair of this oxygen, which would be very well suited to interact with the sigma star orbital of that carbon chlorine bond. CCL axial, and the corresponding orbital interaction, if you're looking at the C sigma star CCL orbital here, this could only interact with a parallel aligned carbon-oxygen bond here. So the other orbital interaction we would have here is the sigma CO bond interacting with the sigma star CCL bond in the equatorial position. And again, here we have a lone pair sigma star orbital interaction that should be better because these two orbitals are closer in energy than the sigma sigma star interaction. Now what does it mean if a lone pair is donating or anything gets donated into the sigma star bond? This means that this bond is becoming weaker because I delocalize now an electron density into the entire bonding orbital. If a bond becomes weaker, it means it becomes longer. And this is exactly what we see here, that apparently 
this orbital interaction here is weakening this bond here. Nevertheless, keep in mind that this is still an overall stabilization because we do resonance structures here, we're delocalizing uh, electron density. At the same time, if you would look at this carbon-oxygen bond here, you would see that it becomes partial double bond character, that this bond here becomes shorter, and overall delocalizing, uh, delocalizing electron density always means a stabilization, although as you can see in this case, you might weaken uh, certain bonds. But just keep briefly in mind, we had the same situation when we did the resonance on the allyl cation. By delocalizing this pi bond electron density to the p orbital here, we are also weakening this bond on the other hand, strengthening the uh, adjacent bond here. And so, although again here you're weakening a bond which makes it longer, and you might think it's a destabilizing interaction, it's true for the sigma CL bond, but it's not true for the overall molecule. And so here in this case, you would have a very hard time to argue with dipole moments. Right, because uh, we are clearly looking here at, at a bond length and it would be very hard to understand why the bond lengths are changing uh, with uh, dipole moments where you clearly have here uh, very nicely uh, can explain that with an orbital interaction. Let's go back and look at some more Confirmations. And let's start with a very, very simple molecule, ethane. Well, of course, you all know that it is most, that its most stable conformation is the staggered conformation rather than the corresponding eclipse conformation. In fact, the eclipse conformation is an energy maximum by the staggered conformation here is an electron uh, is an energy minimum here. And the question is, why is this? And the first argument which might come in mind is that you would say, well, it's probably sterics, right? Because the hydrogens are lined up to each other here, and this should be, for steric reasons, not as favorable as if they are uh, not eclipsed, but if they are uh, staggered to each other. However, if you look at Van der Waals Raleigh, you see that these hydrogens are basically much too small. And there's no overlap here. And so really the steric hindrance is small at best, probably it's not there. Situation changes, of course, if these groups become bigger. So there might be another argument here, and again, it might be a stereoelectronic argument that you could have, again, an orbital interaction between the sigma bonds of the carbo CH and the sigma star orbitals of the sigma of the CH bonds. So in this case, We might have sigma CH donating into sigma star CH. You all know, of course, that this is not a very good orbital interaction. Sigma and sigma star orbitals have huge energy differences. But nevertheless, it might be better than no orbital interaction at all, which you would not have here, because here the orbitals are not properly aligned. As you can see here, if you would draw in 
the sigma star orbital would, would be here. And it could not really overlap very well with the sigma orbital of an adjacent CH bond. So this argument might be, uh, might be a, a good way or good case for saying that the eclipse conformation is more favorable But let's look at another molecule. Let's look at 1,2-dichloroethane. And from this picture, we already understand and learn that eclipse conformations are always better than staggered conformations. Uh, sorry, that other way around, that eclipse conformations are always least, less favorable than staggered conformations. But if you look here at this molecule, 1,2-dichloroethane, you can draw two staggered conformations. You can either draw the anti-conformation or you can draw the so-called Gauche conformation. And if you now look for arguments, if you would look for steric arguments or for dipole arguments, you would probably should agree that the anti-conformation should be more stable, both from a dipole argument, because the electron withdrawing chlorine atoms look into different reactions, different directions, where they are looking into the same direction here. But you would also argue that in the same way from a steric point of view, because the bigger chlorine atoms pointing away from each other, while here they are closer together and there is a Gauche interaction which should be sterically disfavored. However, if you look at this, you again find that the Gauche conformer is slightly more stable than the anti conformer. And again, the question is why is this? And from the dipole argument and from a steric argument, it cannot be easily understood. From an orbital argument, we can again say here that we have donation from the sigma CH bond into a sigma star CCL bond. Now here, of course, we have also to look at the possibilities. What are the possibilities here? We could have interaction between the sigma CL bond and the sigma star CL bond. We would have interactions between sigma CH and sigma star CH. But both of these interactions are not as good as this interaction is. And the reason for this is, again, if you think back on this energy diagram we had with the orbitals, then the sigma CH orbital is higher in energy than the sigma CCL. And the sigma star CCL is lower in energy than the sigma star CH orbital.
And therefore, this interaction is decisive here. This is the best interaction you can find here. But all the other interactions you find in the anti-conformer are by far not as good because the orbital energies are more different than the uh, if you interact sigma CH with sigma star CCL. And so therefore, it can be argued, and that is what is experimentally seen, that the Gauche conformer is more stable. And this here is also known as the Gauche effect. And in your handouts you have, you will have another example for this type of effect from a different molecule. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. Okay. In this example here. Okay, so the question is which sigma CO is interacting interaction is interacting with the Sigma star CL, and it's, should have pointed this out. Let's draw this again here. So here you have a The sigma star CCL bond. And this sigma star CCL is parallel to the sigma CO bond, and therefore these, this bond here could donate in the very same way as this lone pair can donate into this sigma CCL, sigma star CCL bond. So it's always, you look always for the parallel orbitals uh, which then are lined up correctly to do the orbital interactions. More questions? OK, let's look at, it, at another molecule we all know very well. Let's look at an ester. And also an ester can have two different conformers here, where in this case the phenyl group and whatever alkyl group we have here in the ester is oriented anti to each other and this R group and the carbon will come thin to each other, or here it is the other way around. And no matter what the substituents are, esters are almost exclusively in this type of interaction. And of course, this can be argued for steric reasons. One can say the carbonyl group is relatively small, let's say compared to this phenyl group here, and therefore, it's pushing away the substituents. But you can also argue this, again, from an electronic point of view. And you could argue, in this case, 
that this conformer here benefits from an orbital interaction which is between the lone pair of this oxygen <coughs> and the sigma star orbital of this CO bond here. Now realize in this moment that the pi system really has nothing to do with this here. The pi system would not tell us, could not tell us how, uh, let's say we have the other oxygen lone pair which you would consider being sp2 hybridized so that it would interact with this pi system here. However, in both conformations, the pi system basically here or the, is, between, is the same, but you have to invoke the sigma bonds here in order to argue with, confirm, uh, argue with this rotational conformation. And again, if you look at the parallel or the analogous interaction in this case here, we would have the lone pair interacting with the sigma star CC bond here. And again, this should be, as we already know, should be not such a good interaction because the sigma star CO bond being composed with one electron negative element is lower in energy and therefore closer to the lone pair oxygen than the sigma star CC bond would be here. Let's look at IR spectra. And I'm, I'm not sure if you're still tortured in your organic practicum with analyzing compounds simply by melting point derivatives and IRs. Is that still being done this way? Oh, so everybody is nodding, so probably we still do this. So no NMR, right? So let's look at an alkene CH bond here, and we all know that this has a wave number of approximately 3,050 uh, centimeters. Let's look at the corresponding aldehyde. And maybe you remember here that the wave number we have here is considerably lower. It's 2,730. In fact, there is almost nothing in this range but this CH of a aldehyde. And so it's very indicative if you take an IR spectrum of a compound, you have an IR band around 2,700. You can almost be sure that it is an aldehyde because the CH bonds of alkanes come around 3,000 and above 3,000 come the CH bonds of the alkenes. And again, the question is, why is this? And what does it mean first? The lower the wave numbers are in the, in the IR spectrum, the weaker a bond is. And so that must mean that apparently the CH bond in an aldehyde is considerably weaker than the CH bond is in a, is in a alkene. And again, the question is, can we understand this we can understand that again very nicely if we look at the orbitals and if you look at this lone pair here interacting from this oxygen you can see that it is perfectly lined up to interact
with the sigma CH bond, sigma star, sorry, with the sigma star CH bond. And you can see at the same time that if we do the analysis on the alkene, that this sigma star CH bond can only interact with the sigma CC bond I have here on the alkene. So here we would have sigma CH or CR interacting with sigma star CH. And again, this interaction should be much better because the lone pair is much closer in energy than this, to the sigma star CH than the sigma CR bond is to the sigma star CH. And clearly, you can see that effect in the IR spectra to, um, if you analyze the wave numbers here. Let's take another example. There are many more examples for the for IR analysis, and we can do this in the tutorial. We can we will have some problem sets to explain wave numbers there. But since this is a lecture on synthesis, let's start doing some reactions. And again, let's do something very simple. Everybody knows let's look at an SN2 reaction. And in an SN2 reaction, we all learn that it's a nucleophile which is attacking a molecule with a leaving, leaving group, and it's attacking this. carbon from the backside of the leaving group. And the question is, why is this? And again, everybody would say probably it's sterics. And of course, sterics also make sense. If the approach would come from here, then nucleophile and leaving group might get into the, into the way. But an even more powerful, powerful argument is that if you again look at orbital interactions, And if you look here at the orbital in question, which would be the sigma star CX bond here, then this nucleophile would be perfectly lined up to interact with the sigma star CX bond. And what is it doing once it, it is interacting with the sigma star orbital here, this means it is weakening the CX bond. And that is, of course, exactly what we see, because in the, ultimately the CX bond will break, orbital reorganization will occur, and the new bond between the nucleophile and the carbon is being formed. And so therefore, again, interacting with the nucleophile from the backside from an orbital point of view also makes a lot of sense. And as a final example, let's put a relatively complicated case here. Let look, let's look at the die spokes, so-called die spiral, die spiral ketones. This is a 
compound which was invented by the group of Stephen Lay at Cambridge University. And what they looked at is They designed this type of chiral compound here. And the reaction they want to make use of is a reaction very well known in protecting group chemistry is that you can treat a dihydropyrin with a alcohol under acid conditions which will add the alcohol to the double bond and forming this type of keto. And I think you are familiar with this type of chemistry from the carbohydrate couplings Protonation of this dihydropyrin gives you this stabilized cation here. Which then can subsequently, uh, can subsequently add to this alcohol. Now keeping this reaction in mind, the group of Stephen Day did something very interesting. They reacted this molecule with glycerin. And here's a, here's a type of question. If you can solve this in a catalytic, very efficient way, you would be a millionaire overnight. Because what would you like to do? Glycerin is an achiral molecule. It's one of the cheapest compounds we have on the planet. If you would be able to protect one of these hydroxyl groups here, the left one or the right one, selectively in an asymmetric fashion, you would create a, stereos, a chiral molecule here. Because then in this moment, if only one group gets protected, you would form a chiral molecule. I will draw glycerin pointing this hydroxyl group to the front this hydrogen here to the back, but keep in mind this is not a stereo center. We have two identical substituents here on either side. But just to do here, the uh, to react it with this molecule, I would like to draw it into, the, into this, in this conformation here. Now if you look at this here, we have two chiral centers in this molecule. With the diol or with the triol here, we're doing the same type of reactions we are doing here. So we are adding one hydroxyl group here, one of the primaries here, and then the other hydroxyl group will attach to this carbon here. And you can see what this will What this should result in you will be forming a new six membered ring. And the trick here or the analysis you have to do now is to decide what will happen if the left hydroxyl group and the center hydroxyl group will form the ring, or what will happen if the center hydroxyl group and the right hydroxyl group will, will react. The molecule which will come out
here as the most favorable confirmation will be this one here. Let me try to make this a little bit clear. This arm is this arm here. And if you look at this, now carefully, this here over this way is the glycerin molecule. Let me try to do this with the second color here. This arm here is this arm. And I hope you can recognize now that I have incorporated the right side arm together with the central hydroxyl group to form the six-membered ring here. And the left group is being free here. So this conformer here has all substituents. in equatorial position but in addition these oxygens here are axial to each other. This oxygen is axial is an axial substituent on this six membered ring here. If you look at this six membered ring here as a chair this oxygen is in an axial position to this oxygen here. So this conformation here benefits from the maximum anomeric effect And therefore, this is the most stable conformer here. Now, what we will have to do in the tutorial, which we start on Monday, is we should analyze, and maybe you can do this at home already, we should analyze all the other possible conformers. If you would have drawn in the other arm, so if you would have inverted the stereocenter, you would see very easily that then this arm would become into the axial position. However, and it's, in the, it's already in the, in the handouts, let me just draw one more molecule here. You should also realize that in this conformer, again, all substituents are in the equatorial position. Although now I have put the other arm into, the, into this spiroketal conformation here. But in this molecule, the oxygens here are equatorial to this oxygen here. So this conformation, this molecule here, does not benefit from the anomeric effects as much as this molecule does here. And so therefore, this molecule is less stable and is not being formed. And the idea here, of course, is that now, indeed, you have differentiated between the left and the right hydroxyl group with a rather elaborate molecule, of course. So this is a very, very nice application, but it will not make you a millionaire, because what you would like to have is you would like to have a very cheap catalyst which can do this. But nevertheless, you have achieved here now a desymmetrization 
of glycerol, which is a very important application because once you protect now this hydroxyl group and then do an acid catalysis, you would get your glycerin molecule back being protected selectively on one hydroxyl group. And now this has become a chiral building block, which is very valuable out of this very, very inexpensive chemical. So with this, I would like to conclude the first lecture on stereoelectronics. We will have some more examples and some more uh, uh, problems in the tutorial, which we will do on Monday. Uh, questions for this uh, and, and problem sets will be on the net. So download it, think about this, and then we can discuss this uh, on Monday from 10 to 12. Thanks very much for your attention and see you on Friday.